What's up and welcome to Locked on Lakers for a Friday. Andy Kamenetsky here. How do the Lakers and Warriors stack up against each other this season and why do they both feel stuck? That's coming up next, Locked on Lakers. You are Locked on Lakers, your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked on Lakers your first listen every day, Monday through Friday, no matter where you get your podcast. It's always free, never behind a paywall. Your team every day. And Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can watch the show, hang out with over 25,000 subscribers. It's an awesome, smart, fun community of Laker diehards. Leave questions and comments. We often weave them into the show as much as we can. And today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet just five bucks. You get a free three-week trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. My brother Brian's not here today, but I'm going to be joined by Charlie Walter from Locked on Warriors to break down where the Lakers and Warriors stand heading into the season. Both are teams led by generational iconic stars in LeBron James and Steph Curry forever linked to each other uh, most recently team usa that run both teams also may not be able to put their stars in a position to win one more championship before they retire much less this season charlie is going to lead the conversation as part of his wild wild west series breaking down the entire conference so here we go the opinions with the Los Angeles Lakers, though, right now, and the Golden State Warriors from the naked eye and just the NBA fans as a whole, I think, are probably somewhat similar on their outlook heading into this season. It's kind of the word stuck. I heard you say it on a show. Mm -hmm. I had uh, Mike Richmond from Locked on Blazers ask what he thought of the Golden State Warriors, and he was like, stuck. I think the word more so is just question marks because the Warriors do have a lot of tradable assets and they have, quite frankly, a lot of young pieces that can continue to grow. But as of right now, being hard capped, they are, in fact, stuck until they can make some trades. The Lakers seem to be in somewhat of the same boat. That's what happens when you invest $92 million into two players, LeBron and AD. By comparison, the Pistons' top six paid players are combined that same amount this year. So yeah. do the math there. Take that's that, the Detroit. Reason. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason why they were able to go out and sign Tobias Harris and yeah. Tim Hardaway this offseason. Mm -hmm. But how much does that actually do? I, but I feel, I feel this, better man. about our investments, thanks. Yeah, getting into this, man. Um, Who is in the better spot, the Lakers or the Warriors now and in the future? It's an interesting question, actually. Like, for right now, and I don't consider either team like a true front-running contender. I think that's part of what makes both teams stuck to some degree because they both have these, you know, elder statesmen icons of their generation in LeBron and in Steph Curry. Anthony Davis is still an all NBA caliber in his prime. And these are both rosters that are good. They're far too talented to be bad rosters, but they're not good enough right now, I think, either one of them to be true front runners. So from the perspective of LeBron and, and Steph Curry at this stages of their career and what they would be playing for, I think that feels stuck. If you're looking for which team is better right now, like we're set up better right now, I would say the Lakers, because at the end of the day, it's a talent-driven league. And... LeBron James plus Anthony Davis equals more than Steph Curry plus other players, none of whom are as good as LeBron or AD. Um, and I think even if you think the supporting cast around Steph slightly favors uh, what LeBron and AD have around them, I think at the end of the day, that's still offset by LeBron plus Anthony Davis. And I, I think the Warriors... Again, not a bad team, but I think the Lakers are a better team right now and have a, a talent edge on them. What I think, though, is interesting about that question, though, Charlie, is down, down the road, it depends a lot on what you look for from a, from a fan's perspective because the Warriors have Steph Curry, who is set up to be a lifer with this organization, the greatest warrior ever, and unless something 
truly unexpected happens. I don't expect him to play anywhere else, and I don't think anyone else does. And that gives you a level of att- of uh, gives you a level of attachment as a fan. I would think, at least, as somebody who you know covered the last ten years of Kobe's career, was in LA watching it all twenty years very closely, and am a Laker fan and interact a lot with fans. There's a level of attachment and engagement that you're always going to have with a player of that magnitude who's a lifer, who feels like one of yours, that Laker fans I don't think have with LeBron or Anthony Davis, even if they really appreciate what those guys bring to the table as players and appreciate the 2020 championship. There is a level of just, again, engagement that I think Warriors fans are going to have for however long this era with Steph lasts that I don't think Laker fans have. In, in, in a lot of different ways with Laker fans, they're wondering more, when is this going to end? Because for practical reasons, at some point we need to turn it, turn the page, as opposed to I get a sense with Warrior fans, yeah, you want to make sure that the team is set for something moving forward, but you never want to see Steph go away. And I think that's a big difference. Yeah, the Warriors are trying to turn this thing into a second book. Like, Mm-hmm. They're trying to turn it into the uh, the sequel here with Steph Curry a part of it, kind of bridging a gap. Like I always compare it to the San Antonio Spurs. I'm sure there's a better a better comparison out there, but they seemed like in the early 2000s with David Robinson and, and Tim Duncan and Bruce Bowen and some of those guys, and then they kind of start adding in different pieces, Manu and Tony Parker, and then they kind of bridge that gap once they get older, bringing in Kawhi. I know. Um, they didn't win a championship with some of those 60 win teams or whatever, but they did win one with Kawhi, obviously beating the Heat. But that's what it seems like the Warriors are, are trying to do. It's easier said than done. In order for it to get done, they have to have like seven things go right. You know, Pajimski has to be an all star. Jonathan Kaminga has to be um, literally one of the faces of the league. Like he has to be excellent. Curry can't drop off, he can't get hurt. The same goes with Draymond Green. Um, they need their mid-level guys to stay healthy and be very solid. And then uh, they need Andrew Wiggins to be like 21, 20, 22. All those things can go right, you know? But um, with the Lakers, what is kind of – because you hinted at it. Like at some point, they got to turn the page. They got to look ahead to the future. Future is always scary. The unknown is scary when you're heading out into the abyss. What is in the Lakers' future, do you think? If, if you had the GM tag, how would you be looking at this thing? They're in a really difficult position right now, Charlie, to make moves because they don't have a lo- any expendable contracts. Like all of their contracts from a salary perspective, in terms of guys who make enough money that if you move them, you could either buy themselves or stack a couple contracts, bring back an impact player. It's all their guys who are like, three through six in their rotation. D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, Rui Hachimura, Jared Vanderbilt, Gabe Vincent, if you want to go one further. Even if you think those guys are not at the level that you need to be around LeBron and AD to compete for a championship, they're still the top end of the rotation for this team You know, by a pretty sizable margin. So you can't just move them for the sake of, I like to say, performance, you know, to look like you're doing something so it doesn't seem to fans like you're sitting complacent with LeBron and Anthony Davis. You can make things worse by doing something just to, frankly, get fans off your back. And that's where I think the Lakers get their, the word stuck again comes up because D'Angelo Russell, for example, if there was a home for him to bring back a player that would be an upgrade, They'd have done this by now. They've been trying to trade D'Angelo off and on for a few years. No Zach Levine? (laughs) I don't think that makes him out. Yeah. (laughs) Does not make them. In my opinion, Zach Levine does not. He does not make them better enough that you. It would be worth moving. Not just D'Angelo Russell, but Roy Hachimura and either Jared Vanderbilt or Gabe Vincent just to make the money work. I mean, Zach Mm -hmm. Levine makes 40 something million dollars. Putting aside the skepticism I have, I think, understandably, that Zach Levine's going to be able to stay healthy enough to really provide that support 
for a team with LeBron and AD and their concerns, Zach, Le- Zach Levine, even if you think he is better than D'Lo, Rui, and Vanderbilt, he's not better than all three of them together. Like He's not at that level of a player. So it, it gets... It gets the Lakers back to a place where they just the moves to make are not easy for them. They they could really use a totally expendable nineteen million dollar player, and they don't have one. It's tough to get them. No, it's, it's very it's, difficult. It's, it's tough to go out there and get them. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we got something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet just five bucks and you get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. And then with a YouTube TV based plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment and you can cancel anytime. And while you are getting ready to sign up, you can also think about the 24-25 odds for the upcoming NBA season. And the Lakers right now, our fans at FanDuel, as of this recording, 35-1 to to win the championship. Anthony Davis, 151 for MVP, 25-1 to for Defensive Player of the Year. Max Christie, 150-1 to for Most Improved Player. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. Thanks for making Locked On Lakers first listen of the day. For your second listen, enjoy the Locked On NBA podcast. There's no offseason in the NBA, and Locked On NBA provides daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less. No one keeps you as informed and entertained as Locked On NBA, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's play a little time machine game here. If we did have a time machine, the hypothetical time machine, and... We're going Lakers and Warriors with this one. I would say just right out of the gate, if there was a move that they could go back in time and rescind that would help them not be stuck in this position. Like, is there one particular move? I could look at a few with the Warriors, you know, obviously maybe trading away the second pick and and that turned out to be James Wiseman or just drafting a Lamella Ball, someone that was a little bit better, not paying Andrew Wiggins as much Anyone? as they paid him. I maybe think, I think trading anyone. Clay Thompson last season. <laughs> like th- there are plenty of moves. What's the big one with the Lakers that uh, you're sitting on? Well, I mean, it, it, it's obviously Russell Westbrook. I mean, there, there's, there's not even a, unless you're just being a contrarian. There I kind of is forgot about no that era. And it wasn't long there, ago. There is. I know it. It's the Lakers have been pulling themselves out of it so dramatically and and loudly with so much you know stuff swirling around it's easy to feel like that was a long time ago but you said over the last five years that's definitely within the last five years oh yeah russ is clearly the answer the close second though or at least in terms of things that really made an impact that uh, it got attention at the time but i think especially now you look back on and truly what were they thinking was the economically, the self-imposed economic decision to choose between Alex Caruso and Taylor Horton Tucker, which was purely a money thing. The Lakers could have kept both. It was not a salary cap thing, anything like that. It was they self-imposed economic restrictions where it was you need to choose between Caruso and Taylor Horton Tucker, which never really made any sense. But if you're going... To impose that on yourself, you have to choose Alex Caruso, who was a better player then than Taylor Horton Tucker, much less now, and was also the less expensive player between the two. And, you know, Westbrook is going to be the loudest mistake, the most expensive mistake, the one that cost them the most infrastructure, all of that. But the decision to let Alex Caruso walk purely over money is one that I think also has really, really hurt the organization over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, Russell Westbrook, that's uh, it's a good answer for that question. I it's said. the only answer, Charlie. It, Any it other, I'm just being a contrarian for the sake of dumb devil's advocate arguments like that's yeah. clearly the answer yeah like the warriors you can have some arguments at least with uh like i said with wiggins with not potentially trading clay when his stock was a little bit higher last season uh with not trading the, the wiseman pick i mean depending on who the party is you can at or least just picking literally anyone but wiseman 
Yeah. Literally. What's he doing now? Pacers or am I wrong about yeah, this? Yeah, no, it is. Okay. It is Indiana. I haven't been keeping up with uh Jimmy Wise. My my Jimmy Wise tabs have not been open lately, but he is with the Indiana Pacers. That That's is right. See if he can resurrect the career there. Uh let's transition this to a little trade talk. I have been doing this wild, wild west tour. You are now the third team up on the stop as we make our way throughout the West. First up, the Dallas Mavericks. The easy correlation was, all right, the Clay Thompson news. How does he fit in the Mavericks? Let's hear from a, a Dallas fan's perspective. They're all jazzed up. Warriors fans, meanwhile, are like, eh, Clay may be cooked. Um, as for the Portland Trailblazers, it was, will they ever make a deal with the Blazers again after Gary Payton, the second came back hurt and the whole medical situation. Then we started talking about, you know, Robert Williams, if they did want to make a deal, he could be someone that uh, would be enticing if he can stay healthy, but would they go after another injured often player on the Portland trailblazers? Dunleavy will probably say no uh, with the Lakers. The, the correlation is stuck. That's kind of the, uh, the theme of the show, but I also wanted to talk about trade partnerships. If it would make any sense do you see any players on either team that it's like, huh, we could maybe look at that come deadline time or just no? You know, I, I knew this was going to be asked and I thought about it. And the answer, I can't think of anything. I mean, it's pretty clear by, I mean, if you thought about, okay, the, the none that I think would actually happen, I guess is the, the long of the short of it. Like, you know, could Draymond make sense for the Lakers? Sure, you could find a way to make it work. The Warriors are never going to do that unless Steph gives his blessings. And I think it's pretty safe to say by now, if waves arms around that's happened has not led Steph to say, I, I want this guy out of here, there's clearly no red line that, that Draymond can cross that will make Steph say, I've had enough. Like for better or for worse for the Warriors. Like and obviously the Warriors are not going to trade Steph. So you start going down the roster, like Andrew Wiggins, he's had one good season, like one really like revelatory season, arguably in his career. But the last the last couple since the Warriors won that championship have been really disappointing. If I can't imagine the Lakers would be willing to roll the dice on trying to figure out the formula for getting Andrew Wiggins back to that form if a formula even exists, you know, come on, Looney could have some utility for the Lakers. They could really use a, a backup big, but he's the only size on the Warriors. And if I have to assume that if the Warriors have not given up either Kaminga or Pajemski for some of the rumored offers that have been out there, the Lakers have nobody on their roster that they would do it for other than Anthony Davis or LeBron. And those aren't going to happen. So, no, I, I, I really went through both rosters and gave this some thought. And I'm like, I can't think of anything that even is realistic, much less would make sense for the, for both sides. You can almost go through any team in the NBA and find something, right? You can find something, a lower level player on the roster. It's like, all right, that makes a little bit of well, sense. The only way it would happen would be if Steph said, trade me to the Lakers, or if LeBron said, trade me to the Warriors, like something where the foundation of both teams are going to be radically changing. Mm -hmm. Because like, again, as long as Steph wants to be a warrior, they're not trading Draymond. Like I can't, I can't imagine a scenario where Steph finally says trade Draymond and you know, like Draymond wants to go to the Lakers. Like they, they, Draymond would have to do something so egregious that I don't think the Warriors are going to move Draymond to his preferred destination after putting himself in the place where they're making this trade in the first place. Like it, it it's no. I, back to the stuck, the stuck theme, Charlie. We're back to stuck. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's fall. The kids are back in school, and they're going to inevitably complain about classes and learning. But the reality is. Kids like being challenged. They like finding their passions. They love to learn about who they are. But it never feels like as an adult, there's enough time to exercise that same intellectual curiosity. And even if there was, you wouldn't be able to break through the walls we all create for ourselves as adults. But therapy can help you learn about yourself and tap into the best version of yourself. I can speak to how much talking with a professional 
therapist helped me and my family during a really difficult period, just figuring out compromises that leave you feeling heard and fulfilled and allowing you to, again, tap into that best version of yourself. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible, suited for your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. The big connection, I guess, would be that both, again, could be right in that range where they're fighting each other for playoff spots. We mm -hmm. could see it, you know, in the play-in tournament. We could see, you know, one team fighting for the six, another fighting for a, a seven. Like, there are a lot of situations that are playing out in my head that could see me basically having vested interest in, you know, the, the Lakers and you having vested interest in the Warriors come April. The Lakers, they exercised pretty much all their options. The players did. So they're running it back with a roster that finished seventh in the West. They've added uh, Dalton Connect. They've added Bronny James to the draft. I wouldn't expect to see any Bronny. You can tell me if uh, Dalton's going to get some minutes this upcoming season. But the roster's pretty much the exact same for a team that finished seventh. However, four key role players last year combined to miss 190 games. How big a deal is that in the present? It is a big deal in the present, uh, in part because two of those players, Christian Wood and uh, Jared Vanderbilt, there are some questions about their availability heading into the season. We know Christian Wood, it was announced that he was uh, earlier this week that he was having surgery. He's going to be reevaluated in eight weeks. So he's likely missing at least until November. And Jared Vanderbilt, there is some reporting that his problematic foot that kept him out for most of last year that he's not all the way back it's not quite it's not quite clear what that means how long that will keep him out you know i i have heard most recently from dan woike of the la times covers the lakers that this may be to some degree just extreme caution with wanting to get a guy that's very important on this team he's the best perimeter defender he's one of the best defenders on the team period one of the best rebounders on the team he's their best energy guy he's one of their best physicality guys they, they really need him healthy and he plays very hard and I think just the idea we want to not rush anything back and have any type of setbacks so maybe if that means he misses the first two or three games of the season so be it for the sake of the big picture but yeah, and missing those two guys plus Gabe Vincent last year was a very big deal. And there was also the issue of Darvin Ham for reasons that never really made sense, refusing to play Max Christie, who is unproven, but his sample size as a three and D wing have been pretty good and pretty promising. Like, you know, there will be growing pains with any young player who's inexperienced, but they committed to him this offseason. And he's going to be a part of the rotation unless it really shows he can't handle it. You asked about Dalton Connect. I expect him to be getting minutes from the beginning off the bench, you know, maybe a 15 minute role, unless it's demonstrated that he can't handle it. But he'll, he will have defensive issues during the summer league. He, I think, showed that he will be able to score immediately at this level and provide some punch off the bench. Assuming the Lakers can have a pretty healthy roster, <clears throat> excuse me, this season, I think the goal that they should be shooting for is just like as far as like a baseline big picture for this season is make a top six seed and avoid the play in altogether because A, you just want to get into the playoffs without having to worry about any extra steps, but also two, the last few years when the Lakers have been a seven seed, it's because they have had to fight and scratch their way into that play in setting and then get out of it and that takes a toll on you once the actual playoffs begin and the lakers also too have a much easier first 50 games of the season than anything post all-star break their post all-star break schedule is brutal so i think their goal should be even acknowledging the concerns that you have about pacing lebron and maybe even pacing anthony davis you got to capitalize on the early part of the season. You have to value the regular season. And it's something that this organization doesn't always 
put out that ethos, but it's something I think that's going to be really important for them moving forward. I've liked Jared Vanderbilt's game for a long time. Uh, you mentioned injuries. That's kind of been his Achilles foot. I was um, anchor at NBC in Lexington, Kentucky back in 2017-18. Vanderbilt on that team with Coach Cal. Um, mm-hmm. Shea Gilgis-Alexander was on that team. I want to say P.J. Washington was on that team. I think it was a year before Tyler Hero, but that team was loaded. They lost to uh, Kansas State in the Sweet 16, and Vanderbilt didn't play in the postseason. Uh, was hurt you know, the, the first few months of the season, that was kind of like th- his thing, you know, and then we've yeah. seen it in the NBA. It's like when you see Jared Vanderbilt on the floor, like he's a, he's a great role player. He's, yes, he is. He has a defined role and he's very good and, at it. The question is, he, can he, he stay healthy? He does things on this roster just real quick. Like there's nobody else on this team who can do the things that he does all in the same player. So to your point, he's important. Yeah. JJ Redick is probably pretty important. Head coaches, uh, they, they make a difference in the association. Some people don't think so, Andy. You know, some say that we could go out there in a suit and tie and a clipboard with LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and um, some of the other pieces that you know the Lakers had in 2020 that that we could win NBA championships. But yeah, those people yeah, are idiots who say that. Yeah, it's very debatable. I, I would I'd run the full court press all game. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah, game you're, you're it's, it's what i do in 2k man you're fun telling I, d-lo to run a uh, yeah. front court uh, full it's court press I, all game what i do in 2k man i lose by 26 to cpu <laughs> uh anyways jj reddick excitement expectations just from the perspective of you being the, the podcast host seeing the comments roll in and everything what's it like in Lakerland uh in regards to jj reddick i think skept there's some skepticism but I don't think it's so much rooted in negativity as it is you don't know what you have in J.J. Reddick because he's never done this before. And this is an organization that, quite frankly, cannot land on a coach to save its life. Since Phil Jackson retired after the 2011 season, they've gone through Mike Brown, Mike D'Antoni, uh, Byron, uh, Mike D'Antoni, uh, Byron Scott, Luke Walton, Frank Vogel, Darvin Ham. Like, it's very clear that they don't know what they want in a coach. I have often said I don't think they want know what they want in a coach because I don't think they have given it a lot of thought because they don't prioritize it. They've also very clearly used the coach as a scapegoatable position and somebody to point towards when things aren't going well. So there are, I assume, a lot of Laker fans who are skeptical about Reddick just because they feel like, well, if the organization landed on him, I have no reason to have faith in the organization. That being said, though, I understand the appeal. He's clearly a very bright, uh, very basketball-obsessed guy who communicates his thoughts on the game very, very clearly. He's got a charisma. He has a relationship with LeBron. Um, I think he put a pretty good staff around him in terms of experience. And it's a weird thing in the sense that it's, in a lot of ways, a vibes hire. Like, you are projecting what you think J.J. Redick will be based off what he said in an interview. It's like the Tony Romo hire, man, as as the broadcaster. That's what I compare it to. To some degree, it is. I mean, you know everything that... He says he's going to do. You know everything that he says his vision of basketball is about. You don't know how any of this will be implemented because you've never seen him do it before. Mm -hmm. And it's a very difficult job. Um, I think he has a chance to succeed. And I think at least, if nothing else, in the beginning, he will have buy-in. If for no other reason than LeBron is going to buy in, I think, because everybody sees this as his hire. Um, But it... It'll be interesting to see. It's gonna. I am very, very curious about this. I don't think it's a bad hire. It's not the hire I would have made if I'd been in charge. Um, but I think it's an interesting hire, and in a lot of ways, it's a very Lakery hire. Yeah, I mean, who knew that having a podcast, a, a successful podcast, could catapult your career in coaching? You know, from from like uh, junior high basketball to the to the mecca to you know. I know. Uh, to the Los Angeles Lakers. It's crazy. And another question I had for you, because I've been watching this as a huge college basketball guy, 
I, I, you know, I couldn't stand JJ Redick back in the day. I, I, I would do the same thing, the same routine, shooting free throws, the spin, dribble, spin, dribble, deep breath, shoot. I would hit about 45%. He would hit about 92, but he was so disliked at Duke. I know nationally, like he was just a disliked person in the game. He was one of, I would say one of the most hated ACC players I've seen in my lifetime. And he seems, I mean, I, I wouldn't tell this to Warriors fans, but he does seem like pretty universally kind of liked all of a sudden. Like he's one of the cool guys around the basketball game. When, when did that happen? Um, I think over the course of his playing career, um, I think to begin, he was humbled a lot when he came into the league. He struggled in the beginning to get his playing time with the Magic. You know, eventually he carved out his space and then he ended up having a really good career. Um I have heard him described a lot as a people person, and I think he does well with different personalities in general. He also, I imagine, earned the respect of a lot of teammates because he is universally known as somebody who just works his ass off and is obsessed with not just his own craft, but basketball in general. He's just He has described himself and the staff that he put around him as basketball sickos, and I think when you are like that and, you know, somebody who covered Kobe, for example, for 10 years, Kobe had a reputation as somebody with no tolerance for players who were not outstanding or like at his level. And that's not entirely true. He could be frustrated by the shortcomings of players who weren't good enough to bring him what he needed, but what really upset Kobe would be players that he thought did not get the most out of their talent because they didn't care enough. Like, I'll give you an example of somebody who was a former Warrior. Uh, do you remember Josh Powell uh, played mm -hmm. with the Warriors for a couple years? Josh Powell was like the 11th man on the 2009 and 2010 championship teams. You know, he did not play a whole lot. He was behind uh, Pau Gasol, Andrew Bynum, and Lamar Odom in the front court, plus... Ron Artest, who would often play as an undersized four, his playing time was pretty infrequent. Kobe loved Josh Powell, like loved him, because Josh Powell squeezed every ounce of his NBA, of his NBA level talent, which is at the low end of what it what's needed to be an NBA player. But he squeezed it all out. And he cared about winning and he cared about the team and he cared about its success. Kobe loved Josh Powell, even though Kobe knew, like, as far as talent goes, Josh was on the low end of it, but he earned Kobe's respect because he did those type of things. Good stuff. Great analysis today from Andy Kamenetsky. You can follow him on Twitter at Cam Brothers. He's the host of Locked on Lakers, where he hangs out with about 25,000 loyal Lakers fans. Yes, they on are. YouTube, Monday through Friday. And uh, whenever else, he's doing crossover shows, talking with hosts of other teams. But appreciate you coming on, man, and, and great to meet you. Yeah, absolutely, man. We'll do this another time. Thank you. That was my conversation with Charlie Walter from Locked on Warriors. Appreciate y'all being here. Brian will be back on Monday as we get closer to the training camp opening, the preseason, and the actual Lakers season beginning. Thanks again for making Locked on Lakers your first listen today. Go check out the Locked on NBA podcast where the season never ends, providing national expertise with a local perspective. You can find the link to Locked on NBA in the description so you don't need to search part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and we will see you all on Monday.